Hello, this video is all about tropical cyclones. Uh, we're going to look at what is a tropical cyclone, where do we find them, uh, what are they like, and how do they form? Okay, so first of all, what is a tropical cyclone? Um, on the right-hand side over here, we can see a satellite image of a tropical cyclone. Um, so this is an image from space, and you can see it's like a big cloud, a lump of clouds, and it seems to be rotating or spinning as well. Okay. Um, if you were on the ground, it would look a little bit more like this. So these pictures down here show what it might look like if you were there on the ground. So a tropical cyclone is a large rotating, which means spinning area of low pressure with very strong winds. The winds have to be at least 74 miles an hour uh, for it to be classed as a tropical cyclone. Okay. Can you cover up that definition now and see if you can recite it? And keep on doing that until you know that definition off by heart. Okay, so where do we find them? Um, here we've got a map of the world and we can see this line, this red line down here is the equator at zero degrees, so zero degrees of latitude. You'll notice that we don't get them along the equator. So along here, we don't get any tropical cyclones and we'll talk more about why that is a little bit later. But we do get them near to the equator. Okay, so you can see that they do form very near to the equator, but they don't form on the equator. Um, we've got different names for them. So we've got hurricanes, we call them if they hit the Caribbean or USA or Mexico, anywhere in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, if they hit anywhere in the Indian Ocean, they're normally called cyclones. And when they hit East Asia over here, they're normally called a typhoon. Okay, but please don't be confused. These are all words that mean the same thing. So a hurricane, a typhoon, a cyclone, they're all the same thing, they're just different names and they're all a tropical cyclone. Okay, so what ingredients do we need for a tropical cyclone to form? The first thing is it needs to be near the equator, but not on the equator itself, okay? So if we think about a country on the equator like Singapore, um, Singapore has in fact only had one tropical cyclone ever. Um, so tropical cyclones tend not to form along the equator. Um, but they do form near to the equator and they do form approximately 5 to 30 degrees north of the equator and 5 to 30 degrees south of the equator. Okay, so if, if we're up here at 50 degrees north of the equator, then it's, it's uh, too far away from the equator for them to form, it's not warm enough. So it has to be roughly 5 to 30 degrees north or south of the equator. Another really important thing we need is a very warm ocean, okay? Um, so the ocean temperature has to be 26 degrees or higher. And the reason for this is that the tropical cyclone gets its energy from the warm ocean. That's where it gets its source of uh, fuel, that's where it gets its food almost from. Um, so it has to be 26 degrees. If it's below 26 degrees, it's not warm enough uh, for a tropical cyclone to form. And when it is 26 degrees, we get lots of evaporation happening, and that forms our thunderclouds, which will then go on to become our spinning tropical cyclone. Okay, so 26 degrees, that's the magic number. The third thing we need for a tropical cyclone to form is an area of low pressure. We should know by now that low pressure is when the air is rising. This is because the air is very light, so that the air down here can rise up, as it rises, it brings moisture with it, it evaporates, and that forms clouds, okay? And the last thing we need is something called the Coriolis effect, okay? You need to know that, that term, it's very important. And the Coriolis effect is um, an effect that describes why a tropical cyclone spins, and it's all because the Earth is spinning itself on its axes, okay? So because the Earth is spinning on its axes, that also creates a spinning uh, motion on, uh, on, on Earth, and that's why our tropical cyclones spin. Okay, so quick exam question now. It's a state question, so it can just be bullet points or very short answers. State three things needed for tropical cyclones to form. So pause the video, you can do this in your head or write it down. Restart the video when you're done.
Okay, welcome back. So three things we need for a tropical cyclone to form. You could have had any of the following, uh, an ocean temperature of 26 degrees or higher, an area of low pressure, the Coriolis effect, and uh, approximately five to 30 degrees north or south of the equator. Right, so um, we're gonna move on now to look at what characteristics are of a tropical cyclone. A characteristic simply means, what is it like? Okay, and there are two, two characteristics of a tropical cyclone. Very, very strong winds. Remember we said, we said they had to be at least 74 miles per hour and very, very heavy rain. Okay, strong winds and heavy rain. Now what hazards does that create? How does that affect us and what, what are some of the risks that that affects? Uh, how does that affect humans? Well, first of all, if we get lots of heavy rain, it can cause a landslide. Okay, this cliff here, you can see in the, in the, the video, uh, has got very, very wet because it's the heavy rain has made it really, really wet and saturated. And when things get wet, they get very unstable and they collapse. So a landslide is when lots and lots of sediment or rock uh, moves rapidly downhill um, due to gravity. And the really powerful wind can cause a storm surge. Okay, so a storm surge is simply when the wind is so powerful that it can push the sea onto the land. So here you can see the, the, the wind is pushing the sea onto the land, and sometimes that will just continue inland for quite a long period of time. Something else we need to know about a tropical cyclone is, again, here we've got a uh, satellite image from space. We can see uh, this is actually the Gulf of Mexico. Let's go over here, the USA up here. And here we've got a large tropical cyclone. Um, and in the middle, we've got an area that doesn't really have much cloud, and that's called the eye of the storm. Now the eye of the storm is very different to the rest of the tropical cyclone. The eye of the storm is very calm. So when it passes over, there's no wind, it's, it's clear conditions. Um, it would be very, very still suddenly. So it's, the, it's a very calm, uh, has very calm weather conditions at the center of the storm. But, the eye wall is the area directly around the eye. So it's the area around the eye of the hurricane or the tropical cyclone. And the eye wall is the most powerful part of the tropical cyclone. So unfortunately, if it's passing over you, if you hit the, the eye, it will be nice and calm and very still. And then you get the most powerful part of the tropical cyclone coming next, and that's the eye wall. Okay, so how do we measure them? How do we measure a tropical cyclone? We use something called the Saffir Simpson scale, okay, named after Mr. Saffir and Mr. Simpson, who came up with it. And they categorized tropical cyclones from category one, over here on the left-hand side, up to category five, and that's our most powerful tropical cyclone on the right-hand side. Category one tropical cyclones, the wind speeds are between 74 and 95 miles per hour, and they'll cause a little bit of damage, um, but not a huge amount. Category five tropical cyclones, the wind speed has to be over 157 miles per hour. And that will cause major, major damage. That will bring buildings down. Um, to give you some context, uh, on the motorway, if you're driving on the motorway, you'll drive at 70 miles an hour. So it's, if you think about a car driving along the motorway, uh, a category five tropical cyclone, the winds will be going at twice the speed that somebody would be driving on a motorway. Okay, so really, really powerful. Here we've got um, quite a famous tropical cyclone that hit the USA called Hurricane Katrina. Um, it began over here, um, and at this point it was just a tropical storm. It then, the wind speeds then got up to 74 miles an hour and it became a category one tropical cyclone. Okay, as it moved over the warm ocean, uh, the, this is the Gulf of Mexico, very, very warm sea over here, it became a category five at this point. So over 156 miles an hour. And then you'll notice the moment it hit land, it became very weak again and went back to a category one. And the reason for that is that when a tropical cyclone hits land, it loses its source of energy. It loses its fuel, okay? So if we think about the tropical cyclone as if it's a car, it's almost like somebody cuts off the petrol, okay? So once it's over land, it, it can't get energy from the warm water anymore. And so it becomes smaller and less powerful. Right, I'd like you to pause the video now and to try and define 
the following key terms. Uh, you can write this down or you can do it in your head with a partner. Um, can you then restart the video when you've done that? So pause on the video in three, two, one. Okay, welcome back. Uh, these are the following key terms that we were looking at. If you're not sure about any of them, remember you can go back and rewatch the video. You can rewatch parts of it. Um, so a tropical cyclone, we said was a large rotating area of low pressure with very strong winds. Coriolis effect is the force that acts on the earth, which makes things spin due to the earth's rotation. A landslide is a fast downwards movement of sediment as it becomes very unstable. And that's normally when it gets very wet. So this word here we can use as saturation. Storm surge is when the water is pushed onto the land by the strength of the wind. The eye of the storm is the center of a tropical cyclone with very calm conditions. And the Cepher Simpson scale is the scale from one to five that measures the magnitude, magnitude which means the strength of a tropical cyclone. Um, if you got any of these wrong or if you need to mark these, just pause the video now and make sure you know these definitions uh, off by heart. Right, so how do they form? We need to know in detail now there are eight stages how a tropical cyclone forms. Stage number one, uh, first of all, we need to be five to 30 degrees north or south of the equator. Here's my ocean and the ocean's been heated up by the sun, okay? And therefore it will reach 26 degrees. That's the magic number. Once it hits 26 degrees, there's enough heat uh, in the ocean to lead to enough evaporation for storms to form. So that's the first stage. Number two, now that we now the water is 26 degrees, there's going to be lots and lots of evaporation happening from the water. So lots of water rising up. Remember, it's low pressure going on here. Um, as it rises, this is stage three now, it begins to form thunder clouds. Okay, so the warm water down here, we've got lots of evaporation happening. That forms our big thunder clouds. Stage four then. So we've got the evaporation happening. So we've got our warm water rising up. We've got our thunderclouds forming. But underneath that, as all this air rises here, there's a gap that builds up underneath it. And this is an area called low pressure. Okay. So as this air rises up, it leaves an area beneath it, a gap. And so the, there's not much pressure here, and it becomes an area of low pressure. Okay, stage five. So we've got our low pressure. The air around the low pressure though would be high pressure. Okay, so we've got high pressure over here, high pressure over here. Um, think about high pressure a bit like a balloon. So if you blow up a balloon, it's full of high pressure. What's gonna happen when you open that balloon is that the high pressure will rush towards the low pressure. Okay, so that high pressure is gonna try and fill up that gap that's been created. It's gonna rush to the low pressure. And as it does so, it creates a very windy condition. Okay, so the, as the air rushes in here to fill up that gap, it gets very, very windy. And that's what makes our storm get more powerful. Okay, stage six. So the evaporation continues to happen. Uh, the low pressure continues to suck in the high pressure, the air from around it. And eventually our storm gets much, much bigger. And it also starts to be pushed uh, in the direction that the wind is blowing. Okay, now on to stage seven. And this is when the storm starts to spin. And this is because of the Coriolis effect. So remember, because the earth is spinning, the storm also begins to spin and rotate. So because of that Coriolis effect, the storm begins to spin. And the last stage, so here we've got our tropical cyclone. Uh, this is representing the heat coming from the ocean. As the tropical cyclone moves towards the land, it then goes over the land and it loses the heat from the ocean. It begins to lose that heat. As it does so, it gets smaller and then it gets smaller again. It continues going across the land, but it gets much, much smaller because it's lost its source of energy. It's lost the heat from the ocean. Right, quite a lot there. Can you now pause the video? I'd like you to write down on a piece of paper the eight stages in the formation of a tropical cyclone. So just one line for each. If you forget, you're not sure, rewind the video, watch it again, um, and then restart the video when you've written down the eight stages 
or the formation of a tropical cyclone. So pause in the video now. Okay, welcome back. Um, these are the eight different stages for the formation of a tropical cyclone. Uh, I suggest you pause the video now and you mark your work and make sure that you've got these in the right order. Okay, and finally, on to some questions, just to check that we've understood what we've learned about today. There are seven questions on here. Again, I'd like you to pause the video and have a go at these. Uh, you can do it in your head, you can do it with a partner, or you can write it down. So pause in the video now in three, two, one. Okay, welcome back. Um, here are the answers to those questions. So pause the video, have a go at marking those and making sure you've got the correct answers. If there's anything you're not sure about on here in this video or with these answers, uh, please have a chat with your geography teacher.